Okay, so Lincoln was a big advocate of the American system. Uh, the American system was basically national sovereignty uh, for public and uh, government uh, government issued currency for for productive purposes. And so that was versus the British system, which was essentially colonization by debt. <laughs> so Lincoln said in 1832, this is when he was 23, when he was first running for Illinois State Assembly, he said his political principles were a national bank, internal improvements, and a high protective tariff in order to nurture the, the um, businesses, small businesses for industrial development. So that was basically the American system. So already he was onto it at an early age. And when he was elected president, his economic advisor was Henry Carey, who uh, expanded on the American system uh, that was originally developed by Alexander Hamilton and Henry Clay. Next. Um, when Lincoln came into office, he was immediately faced with a civil war and no way to fund it. If he borrowed from the banks, the Eastern bankers were going to uh, charge 20 to 25 percent interest, which would have left um, the government with a crippling debt. So instead, he did what the American colonists did, which was issue paper money backed by nothing but the full faith and credit of the United States. Um, so these were green U.S. notes or greenbacks originally under the Legal Tender Act of 1862, $150 million was issued and spent. But uh, by the end of the war, that sum had increased to 432 million, uh, essentially doubling the money supply. If we did that today, it would mean adding some, if you count M2 as the money supply, it would mean adding $22 trillion to the money supply. And yet it wasn't inflationary as I'll show in a minute, <laughs> but anyway. Um, and he used that money to fund not only the war, but major infrastructure, including the land grant college system and the Transcontinental Railroad. Next. So the same year, 1862, his Congress passed the Pacific Railroad Act, which uh, lent, lent $64 million uh, to build the Transcontinental Railroad. So it chartered two companies to lay the tracks from the Missouri River to Sacramento. So one started at one end and one started at the other end. And by 1869, they met nose to nose in Utah, so they were done. And at that point, they, those companies returned $103 million to the federal government. So not only did this money created out of nothing <laughs> create this amazing railroad system that connected the, the country from end to end, but it turned a significant profit for the federal government. And the money, of course, the, it's the nature of a loan that the money goes out and then it comes back. So it's not inflationary, particularly when it makes something productive like this. Next. Uh, you can see from this slide that it was not, in, that the greenbacks were not in, inflationary. This is the consumer uh, price index and it's shot up uh, in the last 30 years, but, or no, more than that looks like the last, uh, 60 years, but um, so anyway, so so during that period of this of the Civil War, it was not inflationary, a bit inflationary. Next, uh, Milton Friedman said, uh, in along with Anna Schwartz in their in their uh, big volume on monetary history of the United States, they said that uh, the greenbacks did not infl create inflation. They, they, did inf they did devalue relative to gold, but so did all the paper monies. And there were hundreds of paper monies then because the, the, the state chartered banks all issued their own bank notes. And um, Friedman and Schwartz said that the greenbacks were linked to a period of extraordinary rapid, extraordinarily rapid growth. Um, and then this other historian, J.G. Randall, also said in 1937, the threat of inflation was more effectively curbed during the Civil War than during the First World War. Indeed, as John Kenneth Galbraith has observed, it is remarkable that without rationing price controls or central banking, Treasury Secretary uh, Chase could have managed the federal economy so well during the Civil War. Next. Uh, so besides this greenback system where they issued their, they issued money directly, uh, 
Lincoln was responsible for establishing, which what is basically our banking system today uh, with the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 1864. This was under um, Treasury Secretary Salmon P. Chase, who was really responsible for these bills or, you know, so, so whatever's wrong with them, you can blame on him. But anyway, it was a Lincoln would have liked to have established a national bank, as you can tell from what he said when he was 23, but there was so much public sentiment against it after, um, after Andrew Jackson had jet, shut down the second U.S. bank that uh, what they did instead was to create uh, what was called a distributed national banking system. So you had essentially national banks all over the country that were chartered by something new that was set up, the controller of the currency. So the controller of the currency issued U.S. banknotes uh, that were that all looked alike. Here's two two of the those two in that picture are from two different banks, and they have the name of the bank on them, but they they look just the same, and they say United States of America at the top. So it was a, a national currency issued through these many uh, national banks, and in order to get their national bank charter. Um, they had to, in order to get these bank notes, they had to um, secure them with U.S. bonds deposited in the treasury, equaling a third of their paid in capital. So this was another source of income for the government, and it also stabilized the, the banking system. In order to drive out the state bank notes, um, the, the bills, the, the National Banking Acts imposed 10% tax on those bills. So essentially what you had were a lot of national banks, 584 national banks already by 1864. Uh, and the currency was stabilized by the Office of the Controller of the Currency since um, the, the controller put a limit on the number of banks that could be issued and they were limited by by this um, being secured by US bonds. So after Lincoln was assassinated, of course, um, the greenbacks were recalled and silver was demonetized. So the money system radically shrank and drove us into a, a depression that was nearly as bad as the Great Depression of the 1930s. And so there was a strong populist movement in the 1890s to go back to Lincoln's system of government issued money funding um, national uh, infrastructure projects. But of course that failed and what we wound up with was the Federal Reserve and another an even worse depression in the 1930s. But, so that's the end of my Lincoln, <laughs> Lincoln segment.